Uh, before uh, we start uh, the talk, uh, I also want to bring your attention to an NPTEL uh, MOOC on control systems that I offer uh, every year uh, through the Swayam platform. Uh, so this is on a fundamental control systems course uh, whose details can be found at this website. And uh, it is offered as a MOOC uh, from every July to November. So the registrations are currently open. Uh, so if you are uh, uh, or your students or somebody else whom you know, right, uh, wish to look at this course uh, and learn more about its contents and uh, perhaps are uh, interested in registering for this program, kindly do visit the Swayam website and search for uh, Control Systems course. And, uh, you will be able to see more details. Uh, more details are also available at this website, you know, like given here. And uh, I am Shankar Ram. So I am uh, working in the Department of Engineering Design uh, at IIT Madras. Uh, so uh, my uh, research interests uh, lie in the broad domains of mechanics and controls applied to automotive systems and transportation systems. So today I would give a broad overview of uh, control systems, you know, like uh, uh, in a sort of like in a nutshell or a capsule. And we will also look at uh, maybe a couple of case studies like uh, from the automotive domain uh, based on uh, my research group's work uh, so that like we, we can observe how these ideas are also applied in practice. So, uh, of course, I thank all my students uh, uh, with whom I continue to learn and uh, please know that this content is meant uh, only for educational purpose. So let's start from the title of the talk. You know, like uh, if you look, if you look at the broad domain of control systems, there are two words: control and system. So let's ask ourselves what these words mean, right? So if we ask ourselves the question, "What is a system?" That word can mean different things to different classes of people, right? Uh, so, in the context of this particular discussion, uh, we will pictureize a system as an entity, which could perhaps be a collection of objects under study. Uh, it could be a process. Uh, it could be uh, a, a virtual system also, you know, like it may not be a physical system per se. Uh, so, we will take a very broad uh, uh, view okay of the uh, word or the term system you know, as far as our uh, usage is concerned and if we ask ourselves what is when they control so the process the process of control is perhaps to make a system behave as desired so i'm sure uh, in uh, the rooms in which we are sitting and attending the store it is most likely that there may be a ceiling fan right so which we may be are using. So when we switch on the ceiling fan, we expect it to run it at some RPM and we have a regulator through which we can we could also adjust the speed of the ceiling fan. So in a certain sense, when we turn the regulator, we are essentially making the system operate or behave as we desire. So in a in that sense, we are controlling the ceiling fan. So there are lot of examples of control systems around us in our day-to-day -day life, uh, starting with ourselves. You know, the human body is a fantastic example of uh, control uh, because many processes uh, in our body are being regulated, you know, like to operate at very precise conditions. You know, like let's think of body temperature, right? So we want our body temperature uh, to be around 98.4 uh, degree Fahrenheit, right? So even uh, increasing the body temperature by one degree Fahrenheit is going to sort of perturb our body overall. Same arguments can be given for, let's say, regulating the blood pressure, the blood sugar levels, the heartbeat, and so on, right? Um, so we can... Uh, Observe that, you know, like there are a lot of examples of control systems uh, around us. Uh, and I think this is a very exciting domain, you know, uh, and we try to learn from what is happening within us and around us and see whether we can apply our learnings to practice. 
So if we uh, look at uh, systems per se, right? So we are essentially going to deal with what are called dynamic systems, wherein time is the independent variable and all variables that characterize the system are going to be functions of it. So what we do is that like at a very broad level, you know, like we would consider a system as an entity, uh, you know, like uh, which essentially is given an input u of t, okay, u is a function of time, and we get a map output y of t from it, okay. Uh, so let us say, you know, we go to the example of a ceiling fan. So we give an electrical current as the input and the angular speed of the fan is the output. So that's how we could perhaps visualize the ceiling fan. So a dy dynamic system is one wherein all these variables are functions of time. Uh, so the system can be visualized as a mapping S that maps the input U and provides an output Y. And consequently, uh, it could be mathematically written as Y of T equals S of U of T. Okay, so that's how we uh, sort of represent the system mathematically in an abstract sense. So based on, uh, uh, how the system is characterized, we could have multiple classifications of uh, systems. Okay, one is what is called as a linear and a nonlinear system. So, what is a linear system? A linear system is one to which if I provide an input u1 and I get an output y1, and I provide another input u2 and I get an output y2. If I provide what is called as a linear combination of the two inputs u1 and u2 right, C1 U1 plus C2 U2, I should get the same linear combination of the corresponding individual outputs. That is, I should get C1 Y1 plus C2 Y2. Then the system would be called as a linear system. So uh, some call this as the principle of superposition and uh, any system which does not uh, follow this is a nonlinear system. Of course, in real life, you know, like we are going to mainly after nonlinear systems. But many times what happens is that like we can approximate systems as linear and still work with them, right? So that is a very useful approximation. So another uh, useful classification of systems uh, is what is called as a time invariant versus time varying system, right? What, what are these, what is this classification? Right, a system is said to be time invariant if its output remains the same for the same input, irrespective of when the input is provided to it. So what does it mean? Let's go back to our example that we are considering. So we consider a ceiling fan. I come to a room, I turn on the ceiling fan today at a particular speed setting. Let us say the fan is rotating at 100 RP. I come tomorrow, I turn on the ceiling fan, it's going to rotate pretty much at 100 RP, right? I keep on repeating this experiment. Perhaps after a few months, maybe, or after a year, what would have happened is that the fan might have some wear and tear. So consequently, when I switch on the same ceiling fan, perhaps after a year, its RPM may decrease to 99. So in real life, you know, like almost all systems are time varying. That is, their outputs vary depending on when the input is uh, given to it, all right? However, we also ask the question, you know, like as to whether, uh, you know, for the time interval under consideration, whether a system could be approximated as time invariant. So what do I mean by this? Suppose, let us say, I want to analyze the fan only for a few minutes. In those few minutes, the characteristics of the fan are not going to change significantly to alter its output for the same input, irrespective of when it is given. So then perhaps one could consider or approximate this fan as a time invariant system. On the other hand, let us say we have a fan which is used in an industrial application and it is being operated continuously for months at an end. Maybe there, you know, we may need to consider this fan as a time varying system because its characteristics may change with time. So time invariance is an approximation, sorry about that. So yeah, time invariance is once again an approximation and linearity is also an approximation. And typically 
the class of systems uh, which are approximated as linear and time invariant uh, is called as the class of linear time invariant systems, okay, abbreviated as LTI. And this is a very useful class of systems in control theory, you know, which, which uh, are analyzed in a first cut course in control systems. So, and the way we analyze such systems is to develop mathematical models. So, by mathematical models, we are going to develop expressions for this mapping S. So, we have this mapping S, right, which relates the input and the output. So, what we do is that like we develop equations that relate the input and the output and characterize the system response. So, now if we look at for what purpose do we use these mathematical models? So, once again, we, we go and look at uh, the mapping between the input and the output. So, sorry. So, S of U of T. Okay, so we have an input u of t and we map it using the mapping s and we are going to get the, the output y. Okay, so please excuse my handwriting since I am writing with the mouse. Okay, uh, so essentially y of t is equal to s of u of t. So now uh, typically what happens is that like when we start off on a new problem, we typically do the first step which is of synthesis. So what is the synthesis here? We are given the input and the output, and what we do is that like we find this mapping S, okay, that relates the input to the output. Okay, so the purpose of this synthesis problem uh, is to understand what's happening with the uh, system. All right. Yeah. Then once we have understood how the system behaves, so for the uh, example under discussion, uh, if you want to synthesize a mathematical model. We want to get a relationship between the electrical current which is provided to the fan and the angular speed of rotation of the fan. So, that is what we do in the synthesis. Once we complete the synthesis problem, we can do the analysis problem. That is, suppose let us say I give a new input u to the system. I already know what is the mapping between the input and output. I can predict what is the output of the system. So, analysis is typically useful for prediction okay? and it can be also used in design process, right? Because suppose tomorrow someone asks me to design a new fan which will rotate at let us say, you know, like 200 RPM, right? And, uh, and uh, it is expected to have some response characteristics. I can use the model which I have already developed and give it various inputs and see what outputs I get. Right? So, it is pretty useful in that regard. The third uh, problem which one could do is that of control. Okay? So, that is, suppose let us say someone tells me the fan should rotate at 50 RT. So, I now I am given the output which is desired. I already know what is the system under study. What I do is that I find out what is the input which will get me the desired output. So, in the example of the fan, I can, I now calculate what is the current, you know, which will give me the RPM of 50. So, that is the problem of control, okay. So, typically we do the problem of synthesis first, okay, so that like we can uh, get the relationship between the input and output. Then that could be utilized to either do analysis and or control, okay. So, that is how we took typically approach this. Uh, these problems, okay, from the perspective of uh, control systems theory. So, if you look at uh, model-based control per se, you know, like once we develop a mathematical model, you know, it is pretty useful to design controllers in the sense that we can get the first cut range of the values of the controller parameters or what we call as controller gains, which will ensure that we get stability and performance, you know, like for the system or the closed loop system that we design. Okay. So, in that way, model based design is pretty useful. So, now let us look at this block diagram. Uh, if we consider a system, okay, we have certain inputs being given to the system, we have certain outputs coming for the system. 
So once again, you know, like let me stick to the same example. My system is a ceiling fan. I give an electrical current and I get an angular speed as the output. Suppose, let us say, we someone tells us that, look, make the uh, fan rotate at 50 RPM. Okay. So that is what we call as a reference input. Okay. So the reference input tells us what is the value of the output of the system, which is desired. And what we do is that we measure the actual output, which is this, and then we feedback the actual measurement, which is obtained through sensors, and we compare it, compare that measurement with the reference input. Once we, oh sorry, once we do that, we get an error, right? The error is the difference between the reference input and the actual output or the desired output and the actual output. And that error is passed through a controller, which then calculates what should be the input that should be provided to the system to ensure that the output of the system goes as close to the desired output. So when the controller calculates the input to the system, the input is what is called as a control input. And this control input is realized in practice using what are called as actuators, whereas the outputs are measured using what are called sensors. Okay, so this is what is called as a very simple view of a closed loop system with feedback. There are certain important questions that one needs to ask while designing such closed loop control systems. The first question is how to develop system models, right? So because we need to develop that or obtain this mapping, yes, that relates the input to the output. So we need to first figure out how does one get the relationship between the uh, input and the output. So that problem is a very, very important problem. And that typically requires domain knowledge. Is it? Suppose if I want to develop a relationship between the input and the output for the ceiling fan, I need to understand something about the way motors will work, right? And I, I may need to know some laws of physics from electrical sciences and maybe also some uh, laws of mechanics like Newton's second law of motion to develop a system model. Then once we have that mapping, sorry, once we have that mapping, we also ask ourselves the question, okay, how do we select this controller? So what choices are available? You know, like how do we uh, decide the choice? And then we also need to ask ourselves the question, you know, like how do we select the sensors and the actuators? For example, in the exam, uh, in the, the ceiling fan that we have been considering as a, a reference example, we, if we want to control the speed of rotation of the fan, we require a sensor that measures the actual speed of the fan at each and every instant of time, right? So then the question becomes, how do we uh, get a sensor, you know, like which will measure that speed? And then we also need to figure out how do we get an actuator which will ensure that the control input is realized in practice, right? And so that is also an important uh, question to ask. And how do we evaluate the sensor and the actuator characteristics on the design? So what do we mean by this? Suppose, let us say I turn on the fan, right? And the fan takes a few seconds to go to its desired RPM. Now, let us say I have a sensor which measures RPM in a matter of milliseconds. So the sensor is very fast when compared to the fan itself. So then I can neglect the sensor's dynamic characteristics. On the other hand, let's say if I have a speed sensor that measures speed and its response times are in the order of seconds, then I need to consider the sensor dynamics also in my design. Because whatever value I am giving as the measurement at this instant of time would not be the actual value due to the large sensor response time characteristics. A similar argument applies to actuator characteristics too. So if the actuator responds in a matter of milliseconds, then we don't need to consider its dynamic characteristics. 
On the other hand, if the actuator takes also seconds to respond, then we need to consider its dynamic characteristics in the uh, design process. Then there are other questions to ask. That is, what, what about unmodeled dynamics? You know, like what about changes in the system parameters as such? You know, all those questions are come into play as we go further and further into the control design process. So now, uh, once we get a mathematical model uh, for this class of systems under study, typically for the class of linear time invariant systems, their mathematical models would take the form of linear ordinary differential equations with constant coefficients. And once we get such a mathematical representation, we convert that linear ordinary differential equation with constant coefficients into two representations. In what is called classical control theory, we apply the Laplace transform to the governing linear ordinary differential equation, and we then apply zero initial conditions to get what is called as a transfer function of the system. And the transfer function is then utilized to analyze the system dynamics and also design the controller. So the transfer function representation is also called as an external representation basically. On the other hand, we could also rewrite a nth order differential equation, which is the governing equation of the system under study, as a set of first order ODEs and analyze the system. If we do that, we have what is called as a state space representation. And this is the representation which is typically used in what is called as modern control. So what is the difference or the essentially the delimiter between these two representations? What happened was that uh, initially people used the transfer function representation to analyze systems and design controllers and evaluate controllers when the implementation and evaluations were done using analog, analog circuits. Around 1950s, uh, with the uh, advent of uh, digital electronics, uh, people could uh, solve these ordinary differential equations in a time domain. And uh, using the digital uh, circuit implementation, one could then start utilizing the state space representation in the implementation stage. So, uh, in a certain sense, that's why the transfer function representation uh, contributes what is called as classical control. Where a state space representation contributes to what is called as modern control. However, in uh, problems, uh, in real life problems, both representations are useful. Okay? So, as one keeps on uh, doing more problems, you know, like one gets a feel of when to use which representation. So, as a quick example, you know, like all of us know the uh, well known one degree of freedom spring mass uh, damper system. Uh, so, whose governing OD is mx double dot t plus cx dot t plus kx equals f of t, right? We apply a force f and the mass di gets displaced by x, okay? And k is the uh, spring constant of the spring, c is the damping coefficient of the damper. So, and this is the governing ordinary differential equation. So, if we take Laplace transform on both sides and apply zero initial conditions, we will get the transfer function of the system to be 1 by m s square plus c s plus c. Right? Uh, so, this is what we will get as a transfer function of the system. On the other hand, this is a second order OD, right? So, yeah, if we have a second order OD, what we do is that like we in the state space representation, we write it as two first order ODs, okay? And that's what is done here. So, we choose what are called two state variables, x1 and x2, and then we uh, take the derivative, uh, first derivative with respect to time, and we get what is called as a state equation. Okay, which is the first equation. And then we write the output in terms of the state variables and the input, and which is what is called the measurement of the output equation. So both the state equation and the output equation put together give us the state space representation of the dynamic system under state. So uh, one can immediately realize that when we are dealing with state space representation, yes, we do stay in the time domain, but then now we need to know uh, some theory from the domain of linear algebra, matrix algebra, and so on, right? So to analyze 
uh, uh, the system using the state space representation. Whereas when we use a transfer function representation, we require uh, ideas from uh, complex variables and polynomials to analyze the system response. And uh, if we look at any control design, there are always two important attributes, okay, which are extremely critical to any design. So they are the uh, notions of stability and performance. So a control designer first should first ensure that the system that they design is stable, and then they look at performance. So what are the different notions of stability that what could use? So the first notion is what is called stability of an equilibrium state. So what does this mean? So let me demonstrate it using a very simple example. Let us say we take a simple pendulum, right? And I have a ball which is uh, strung from the ceiling and uh, by a thread and it is like this. Now let us say I perturb it by some angle. Okay, and this is how I perturb. Now what's going to happen? This pendulum is going to oscillate above the equilibrium. State, okay, so the vertically downward state is the equilibrium state. So now it is going to oscillate. And of course, as time goes on, the magnitude of the oscillations will decrease because typically we have some aerodynamic drag. And due to the frictional losses, you know, like the magnitude of the oscillations would keep on reducing. Okay, and ultimately, the uh, what to say, the uh, what to say, the uh, uh, pendulum may, may would come back to its original uh, equilibrium state, okay? So that is what is called as a stability of an uh, equilibrium state, okay? On the other hand, uh, we have what is called as uh, uh, input-output stability or bounded input, bounded output stability. So what is this BIBO stability? So this notion of BIBO stability conveys that when we give any bounded input to the system, the output would always be bounded in magnitude. Okay, so this is the notion of BIBO stability. Okay, so this is another notion of uh, stability which is commonly used. It so happens that for the class of linear time invariant systems, the criteria for ensuring asymptotic stability of an equilibrium state and the bounded input, bounded output stability happen to be the same, okay? And that's something which we use in uh, control design. But these are two important notions of uh, system stability. Okay, so now uh, what I am going to do in the next uh, part of the talk uh, is that I'm going to map whatever we have learned, okay? As far as uh, broad overview of controls is concerned, right? So, because we, uh, in control systems, we look at the uh, entity under study as a system. We have an input, we have an output. We want to uh, regulate the behavior of the system as we design. And uh, we want to regulate, we want to achieve that by controlling or adjusting the input to the system. Uh, and we have sensors and actuators that help us uh, realize these objectives. And the controller is the, uh, what to say, sort of like uh, element which will essentially do the regulation operation, okay? So that is at a very broad level. Now, let us look at uh, what we essentially would want, you know, like, uh, as, or let's try to identify, you know, like uh, this notion of uh, control uh, system design by considering a few studies, you know, like from the domain of uh, automotive controls. Okay, so that's what we are going to do uh, now. So when we are dealing with automotive controls, you know, like we are essentially going to now uh, look at how we could perhaps, you know, like uh, apply the ideas that we have learned, you know, like in the uh, theory of control systems in the domain of automobiles. Okay, so that's what we are going to uh, learn. So, uh, oh, sorry. So, let me uh, share a few ideas and then we will uh, do a few case studies. You know, like I'm sure as far as automotive control is concerned, all of us are exposed to automobiles on a daily basis. And we have uh, many uh, control systems that uh, are part of a typical uh, automobile, right? 
uh, see for example you know like we could have um, you know like what is called as a cruise control system right in a cruise control system uh, a car is supposed to essentially travel at a desired speed right which is set by the driver and uh, consequently the uh, uh, the throttle of the car is adjusted such that the car travels at a desired speed okay so then one could uh, have what is called as a collision avoidance system right so nowadays you know like uh, vehicles are being designed with uh, increasing levels of autonomy and uh, all these uh, close to control systems become very important so if you have what is called as a forward collision avoidance system uh, so what happens is that the vehicle uh, suppose we are traveling in a vehicle and the vehicle's area in front is monitored and if there is an emergency or a potential of an accident then uh, the driver is warned and if the driver does not take sufficient action uh, perhaps this collision avoidance system will be triggered and it may do uh, uh, what is say autonomous braking and or steering to avoid a collision okay and thus prevent an accident so there are a lot of examples you know like uh, in the automotive domain so now if we look at uh, you know like what are the components that are typically involved in automotive control uh, there can be multiple blocks you know like or multiple aspects that would be required you know for a person to start working not only in automotive control but in any domain okay but one important thing to note is that like for a good control designer he or she must be good at three important aspects okay that is on sensing control and actuation all three are very very important Okay, sensing is important to get information about what is happening to the system or the process. Control essentially uh, what I say, deals with the regulation of the system itself. And actuation is important because we need to realize whatever uh, control input the controller is calculating. Okay, so if we look at the broad domain of automotive control, of course, we need domain knowledge, right? So we need to know what is an automobile, how does it behave, what is the dynamics of that vehicle and so on right we also need a good knowledge of control theory right and uh, we we may require both modern control and uh, classical control theory that is both the state space and the transfer function based uh, theory of course we uh, need to have a good uh, knowledge of uh, mathematics you know like particularly on differential equations linear algebra complex variables and so on okay and we also need uh, a good uh, handle on various simulation tools because typically when we want to first evaluate these control algorithms, uh, we may go for a software level improvements, right? So to evaluate, to see how the system behaves and so on, right? Uh, so from that sense, uh, you know, like the simulation tools become extremely uh, important, okay? Uh, so, uh, in fact, once we do simulation level studies, we may uh, do evaluation in what are called hardware in loop uh, systems or hardware in loop facilities before we go for uh, in vehicle testing. Okay, so this is typical process followed in uh, any industry, you know, like in the automotive uh, sector. Uh, so, wherein uh, the designs are first evaluated at the software level, then the controllers are tested at the hardware in loop level. And then they are taken to the vehicle ultimate, right, for testing and evaluation. So at IIT Madras, we have set up a hardware loop facility. You know, like uh, this is particularly for heavy road vehicles, but it could be used for what is called software loop testing for other classes of vehicles like cars, SUVs, and so on. Okay. So here we can see uh, that we have a driver module, and we have these uh, axles which form part of a truck. Okay. And uh, that is, all these are completely instrumented with the necessary sensors and actuators. And these are interfaced to a real-time control box, you know, which can be seen here. And a person can sit here and drive a virtual vehicle. And then we see the realization on the screen or uh, the visualization on the screen as to what happens when we give some steering command or accelerator command or brake command, right, through this module. And uh, uh, the entire uh, algorithms and models can be programmed in this workstation and then it is downloaded to this controller during real time testing. Okay, so that's how the system uh, works. Okay, so this is a very useful system to evaluate our control algorithms before 
uh, we uh, we take it to real vehicles. Uh, so uh, to give you a feel of what we do, you know, like I'm going to take uh, three case studies and uh, sort of like map them uh, into the framework, you know, like that we have been uh, looking at as far as control systems is concerned, right? Uh, so uh, the all these are uh, familiar to uh, all of us because I think these are very uh, current technologies that we can find in automobiles, right? So the first one we will take what is called as the ABS or the anti-lock braking system. Then we look at collision avoidance systems and we will look at autonomous steering. Okay? So these are all based on the research that uh, my group has been doing for the past several years. Okay, I'm going to share. The framework and also I will demonstrate using some videos okay as we go on. so first uh, let's look at anti-lock brake systems okay and uh, uh, all other safety systems uh, so to motivate why we need all these safety systems you know like uh, it is unfortunate that India uh, has almost uh, what to say been the number one country in road accidents and road accident fatalities for uh, some time you know like which is a very dubious distinction I'm sure none of us want India to be in that position, but unfortunately, we can see that uh, consistently there are around close to one and a half lakh fatalities per year, right, or due to road accidents, okay. Uh, so that's a very high number, you know, like uh, when we compare it to other countries, okay. Uh, so we want to do something about it, okay. And that is why the government has proactively introduced various safety measures, right, and rules and regulations. And in fact, if you look at the uh, distribution of these uh, accidents and fatalities across the classes of vehicles, we see that trucks and buses, although they constitute only 5% or 6% of the total vehicle population, they contribute to nearly 30% of road accident fatalities, you know, like which is pretty high, right, and disproportionate. Because in India, you know, like a lot of uh, public transportation happens through buses. And we unfortunately read about accidents in the news wherein a bus has an accident and uh, there is a severe uh, uh, or a huge loss of life, you know, like because many people are traveling that bus, right? So consequently, uh, trucks and buses are uh, very well regulated as far as the safety performance is concerned uh, in India. And all these uh, active safety systems are uh, like ABS is now mandatory, okay, in trucks and buses manufactured in India, okay? Uh, so let's look at the physics behind this and then like we will see how to formulate it as a, a controls problem, okay? Suppose we take a pneumatic tire, right, which is rotating uh, and the vehicle is moving uh, in this direction, okay? As far as our screen is concerned, the vehicle is moving from right to left. Let us say the speed of the vehicle is sub V, okay? And the, uh, uh, what to say? The uh, wheel or the tire uh, wheel assembly is rotating at an angular speed of omega. Okay, so what happens is that like we apply a braking torque TB, okay, at the wheel, and there is a normal load at the tire road interface. Let's call it W, and there is a braking force which is generated consequently at the tire road interface. Let's call it this FB. Okay, so now what happens is that. A pneumatic tire slips at the tire road interface, you know, like this does not undergo a pure rolling motion. So there's some a parameter which is called as longitudinal slip ratio or the wheel slip ratio, which is nothing but V minus R times omega, R being the tire radius divided by V. Okay, this is how it's taken uh, during braking. So some people will multiply it by 100% to uh, provide it as a percentage. So what happens is that eh? You can immediately see that V is the longitudinal speed of the vehicle, R omega is the circumferential speed of rotation of the wheel. Okay. When V equals R omega, the slip ratio becomes zero, right? And we have a purely rolling wheel. Okay. So this is pure rolling. Okay. And when omega becomes equal to zero and V is non zero, what will happen is that like we have a locked wheel. Okay, imagine that, you know, like we break very suddenly, right? You have seen scenarios like that, where the wheel will stop rotating, but the vehicle is still moving. We call that as, uh, in a colloquial sense, as the, that the vehicle is skidding, right? Yeah. So when the vehicle is skidding within quotes, omega becomes zero. So V is non-zero. So lambda is V by V, which is one or 100%. 
locks. So that is what is called as a fully locked queue. In fact, if you look at, sorry, if you look at what is called as a friction coefficient, which is nothing but the ratio of the braking force divided to the uh, normal load of the tire road interface, you can see that typically for a pneumatic tire, we get the maximum friction coefficient at some narrow band of wheel slip ratio, okay? So that is the reference slip that we want to regulate the wheels operation. And obviously when we don't want the wheel to lock, right? Because not only will the friction coefficient reduce, we may also get into unstable vehicle operation, okay? And that is why the system is what is called anti-lock braking system, okay? So I hope the terminology is clear. Why it is called anti-lock? Because we want to ensure that the wheel doesn't lock by through the use of this anti-lock brake system. Furthermore, we want to ensure that we are able to operate in this, uh, what is say, optimal band of yield slip ratio and ensure that we get the maximum possible uh, friction coefficient, right? So that will ensure the maximum braking force. Maximum braking force means maximum deceleration and smallest possible stopping distance, okay? So that is what we want to achieve. So I hope the uh, physics and the motivation be behind the ABS is clear. However, there are a few challenges. What are these challenges? As I mentioned, you know, next, so suppose, let us say we take this curve, right? And let us say the peak, uh, what to say, friction coefficient is obtained at some lambda ref. Okay, so that is our reference slip, okay, which we want to control. Now, we can see that this is for what is called as a dry road surface. And the curve keeps on varying for dry, wet, snow, icy, muddy surfaces and so on. Okay. So the value at which we will get our peak friction coefficient will keep on varying, you know, with the road condition. And that is something which you and I will not know a priori, right? When we are driving the vehicle, yes, we may be able to see what is the condition of the road. But let's think about the ABS system, right? The ABS is not going to be in a position to figure out automatically what is the type of road in which we are traveling, right? So that is point one, okay? The second point to note is that we can, let's say even if we know what is the uh, optimal reference slip, right? That we want to regulate the system in. Right, or what is the lambda ref that we want to regulate the system or the vehicle or the tire at? We do not know what is the actual value of lambda at each and every instant of time. Why? Because typically we may measure omega, but we don't measure V okay, in an actual vehicle to the level of fidelity that is required for the ABS operation. Of course, one may immediately think is the speed not displayed in a car? Of course, it is. Right, but it is calculated from some rotational speed. Obviously, when the wheel locks, you know, like that, that, that idea or that methodology is going to give us very inaccurate results, right, as far as V is concerned. So, not only do we do, do not know lambda ref, which is the reference input, we also do not know what is the actual lambda at each and every instant of time. So, this makes the control problem even more challenging. So, if you look at it, that is why this block diagram is a little bit more complicated than the simple block diagram that we looked at, right? So if we consider the uh, output, we need an estimator, right? To estimate the wheel slip ratio. And then we also need a block before and to figure out the reference input, right? Because we don't know what type of road we are traveling in. And then we essentially have a control algorithm which will then compare the, the estimated reference slip and the estimated actual slip, okay? Please note the level of complexity is increasing, right? And then it calculates what should be the braking which should be done. And this is where actuator dynamics comes into play because the brake actuator also takes time. So we need to have another loop or level of control to ensure that we are able to regulate the system. So we can see that the ABS employs a very complex control algorithm consisting of multiple loops, right? And multiple blocks or entities, right? Estimators and controllers to 
get the desired output. Okay, so we will look at a demonstration uh, after we complete our discussion. Okay, so we can see that we have sort of mapped it to what we uh, study, right? As far as uh, the control system is concerned. All right. Now, going to the second case study on collision avoidance system. So, as we discussed, you know, like a, by a forward collision avoidance system, you know, like we want to ensure that we, we would like to uh, first provide a warning to the driver if there is a risk of collision. And if the driver does not take sufficient action in reference to a warning, we would want to do maybe autonomous braking, right, to prevent a collision. So, and research has shown that even if we are able to give a additional half a second of warning time, we can avoid collisions by 60%. And if we give an additional one second warning time, we can avoid collisions by 90%, right? So, that's a huge advantage, okay? So, we follow a similar uh, thought process as far as a collision avoidance system is concerned, and we can we can essentially come up with a control structure, all right, or a closed loop structure for this, okay? So what happens here, suppose we have a vehicle in front of us, we know its position and velocity, we call that as the lead vehicle. The host vehicle or the subject vehicle is the vehicle in which we are traveling, all right? So now what we do is that like we try to get the position of the host vehicle and the position of the lead vehicle, we compare them, we pass it through the collision, collision avoidance controller, which has its own algorithm. And then it then takes a decision to break. But then here also wheel slip regulation becomes very important, right? So see, I can't have an on-off controller here, right? Either you break or you don't break. Because see, for example, you know, we may be going on, on night time under rainy conditions. You know, that is when we may require these advanced uh, driver assistance systems like collision avoidance. Right. So imagine going on under those conditions, you know, like the roads may be wet. So the traction or the friction capabilities of the tire road interface may be on the lower side. So consequently, the collision avoidance controller needs to be integrated with the wheel spit regulation, wheel slip regulation algorithm to regulate the brake, you know, like and ensure that we don't have a collision. Right. So once again, you know, like lot of information which is required for uh, even this controller uh, is estimated because uh, some information is measurable, some information cannot be directly measured. So we estimate those values, right? So using some algorithms. So uh, that is how a collision avoidance algorithm is uh, implemented. Okay, I will demonstrate a video for that also. And uh, today, uh, we have increasing focus on uh, autonomous vehicles, right? So one research we did a few years ago is to make a vehicle follow a desired trajectory, you know, uh, on its own, right? Uh, so essentially, we use a very simple model for the vehicle, right? And then we, what we do, uh, is that like we essentially design a controller to ensure that the vehicle follows a desired heading, right? So we want to ensure that, you know, like if my vehicle follows the, wants to follow this desired path, it may be off from the path by an offset, right? And it may not also not be aligned along the path, right? So we want to ensure that it follows the trajectory. So then what we do is that like, once again, we use a controller structure, wherein we use uh, a desired, we have a desired heading and we measure the actual heading and we feedback, we use, use a controller to calculate the control input. And here, the dynamics of the steering actuator becomes important, okay? See, why is this important? Let us say we are driving a car, right? So if we want a steering angle of 30 degrees at this instant of time, would we immediately get it? Certainly not, all right? So there's going to be some dynamic characteristics of the steering system also. So we figured out that the incorporation of steering actuator dynamics is an important step in this process. And you can immediately see uh, how the implementation changed, right? So you can uh, observe that the blue dots are the experimental ones, okay, on the actual vehicle, okay, where we have plotted the heading angle and steering angle is a stein, all right? And the 
blue dashed ones, light blue dashed ones are the simulations without considering the actuator dynamics. So you can immediately see that the one without actuator dynamics, when we simulate the model and the controller, it's asking for unrealistic steering inputs, right? Imagine a wheel assembly being steered by nearly 25 degrees instantaneously. That's not going to happen in real life, right? Exactly. So that is why we get, we see very poor control performance. On the other hand, you can observe that the pink line is the one where the controller is designed using actuator dynamics. And we can observe that that is much closer to the experimental value than the blue one. And we can also see why, right? Because the incorporation of the steering actuator dynamics ensures that we are able to generate and track the realistic steering angles, right, in practice. So that is a very big advantage, right, of this process. So we have to consider various aspects, okay, when we do a control design. Okay, so as closing remarks, yes, model-based methods are very effective tools for control design. Okay, if properly used, they can save us a lot of time and give us quite a bit of advantage, right, in designing appropriate control algorithms and control systems for practical problems. Of course, there are certain challenges like any other domain, right? So what are these challenges? We should have sufficient domain knowledge to start synthesizing mathematical models that will characterize the system response, right? Is it not? Because I cannot suddenly, let's say, jump into process control, right? And start addressing problems, right? Because I may need to know how chemical plants, chemical reactions may work, right? And then only I can start designing controllers for that. So domain knowledge is very important. And as we have seen in the case studies, knowledge of sensor and actuator characteristics are very important, okay? Obviously, you know, like the actual design process or uh, practical designs, you know, like also need to consider the effect of unmodeled dynamics. So we typically uh, provide very simplistic mathematical models or use simple mo models as a first cut approximation and develop controllers. But in real life, the actual system may be much more complex, right? So we may need to factor in the effect of unmodeled dynamics and even systems parameters may differ, right? So think about it, right? Let's say we have a car, we have a steering system, you know, I keep on operating the car, there may be wear and tear of the tire, the steering linkages and the system and so on, right? So we may need to factor in the variations in uh, the system parameters too, right? So all these have to be considered, right? When we are designing the actual closed loop control system, okay? So with this, I conclude my talk. I will just uh, show a few videos uh, to demonstrate whatever I, I case studies I talked about. So let, let's watch the videos. I will play them a couple of times so that like we uh, discuss what's happening. I hope the videos are uh, visible, okay? Uh, so one minute, let me play the first video. This is on ABS. So let's see what happens. So uh, you could, uh, let me explain what happened and I'll play the video once again, right? So you can see this bus, which was traveling, okay, at reasonably high speeds. And then like it entered a stretch of road, which is what is called a split coefficient road surface, right? You have, we have dry asphalt concrete on one side, let's say wet asphalt concrete on another side, right? And then the driver brake because there was some maintenance going on the roadside, right? And what happened was there, when ABS was not there, you see this uh, ghosted uh, bus, right? So that spun out of control and you would have seen the wheels locking, right? And uh, it spun out of control and it went and collided and had an accident. On the other hand, when ABS was activated, you know, like it brought the vehicle to a safe stop, right? So this is obtained, this is a video which is obtained from the hardware and loop system that I showed you before. So now let me uh, replay the same video with this understanding and then let's observe what happens. So now you can see this lock wheels here, right? So that's why it became unstable, okay? But with ABS, 
uh, this one didn't lock this bus and then like it would stop in a stable manner. So similarly, uh, let me demonstrate uh, a collision avoidance system implementation. Let me play the video, then I will discuss and then we will replay the video. So what happened here was that like there's a bus and there's a car in front of it, right? In the first example, uh, the driver misjudged the car's location, right? It may happen during nighttime, poor weather and so on, right? And consequently, uh, the driver did not apply enough braking and there was a collision, right? So and you can see that this is the brake which is uh, used in an actual truck and you could see that being actuated, right? You could see this reading in the actuator changing also, right? Uh, and uh, in the second instant, when the collision avoidance algorithm was activated, uh, the, uh, the algorithm intervened automatically and ensured that the collision was prevented. Okay. So let me play the video once again with this understanding. So this is the first scenario where the collision happened. Okay. Now, this is the second scenario where the collision was prevented. So we could observe that in this manner, the algorithms that we use, right, uh, could be utilized uh, to design uh, controllers for practical applications, right? And, uh, you know, like uh, we can essentially then evaluate them at various levels, either at the software level or uh, in the hardware input level or in the actual system itself, right? So, and then like uh, try to implement them in real life. But we should keep in mind the challenges uh, that are typically encountered, right? So, we have to essentially uh, ensure that we have good domain knowledge, we have good characterization of the system. Uh, we should characterize the process that is of interest to, it, to us without the mathematical modeling model becoming too complex, okay? So, that is a trade-off, you know, like it's a very difficult balancing act. You want to capture the main uh, characteristics of interest, but at the same time, you know, we don't want a very complicated model, right, which is not tractable for design and analysis. And uh, we should always keep in mind uh, that uh, we need to deal with sensing, actuation, and control, okay? So these are three important uh, verticals, right, that we need to be good at for us to do practical designs. Okay, uh, so I will end my talk here uh, and uh, thanks for your attention and I would be happy to answer questions now. Yeah, any questions? Okay, uh, so I'm just reading one question in the chat box. Uh, how to sequence the actions of when there are more than one control systems? Okay, so it's once again, uh, you know, like uh, uh, we need to look at the problem in question. So let us say, you know, like we, we essentially go back to uh, the um, examples that we showed, right? So that we had uh, a loop control structure, right? Because we had one control system uh, which is looped within another one. So that was because that is how it naturally fitted, all right? So one needs to look at an application. So we may have a series linkage or a loop within a loop, right? So, you know, like essentially, uh, it, it is really dependent on what the problem is, you know, how we want to pose the problem and also, uh, characterize the problem, right? So I think uh, it depends on uh, the task under uh, consideration. There's another question say, which just states if the ABS fails, yes, of course, uh, any system can fail. 
so but please note that the anti-lock brake system is built on the existing brake system so abs is only uh, on top of the driver's brake braking input right so it, it doesn't replace the driver okay please note that uh, so if the abs uh, fails the, the the basic brake system still continues to function right and the driver can still use their expertise to uh, ensure that the vehicle can be stopped okay on the other hand, if the brake system fails, there is we have a serious problem at time. All right. So, so once again, the ABS is one only built upon the basic brake system, you know, which is already available in the vehicle. It's an added functionality that, that we give you know, to the vehicle braking system. Participants, you can able to ask questions uh, in the chat box. Hello. Yeah, so till now I have uh, received, I could see two questions in the chat box. Uh, okay. Yeah, So, um, if no more questions, then uh, we will. Uh... So, there is another question uh, where the question is when the vehicle is to avoid rotation as well as collision, how to manage? So, now we are uh, we are going to. Uh, what is called as an added functionality called as an electronic stability control or electronic stability program, wherein uh, we want to ensure that you know, like we uh, we regulate the braking at each and every wheel, right? So that we don't have this unintended rotation, what is called as unintended yaw motion. So you could observe that in the video which I showed you on ABS, right? So the bus sort of like rotated about the vertical axis, right? So that is what is called your motion. So that happens when we are not balancing the brake force on the four wheels in the appropriate manner. And this problem is further accentuated when we go on what is called as a split friction road surface. What do I mean by that? Suppose imagine that we are traveling on a road and it has rained and water has collected on the left side. And suppose we are traveling in a four wheel vehicle our right wheels are on dry surface, left wheels are on a wet surface. Now we brake, okay? Then what happens is that like the, there may be an imbalance between the braking forces which are generated at the right and the left wheels, due to which there can be an unintended rotation. So this can be addressed by various uh, uh, logics, right? Which, uh, which are connected with both anti-lock brake system and uh, electronic stability control. It would involve controlling the brakes of the individual wheels, right? Or individual groups of wheels, okay? That's how it's okay. Okay, uh, One minute, you know, so the next question. Uh, so the next question is on, what is the difference between discrete control system and digital control system? Uh, so uh, see uh, the word discrete and digital, you know, like are, many times used synonymously, right? So, in fact, if we look at it, uh, discrete in discrete control, we tend to uh, analyze the system by looking at time as a discrete variable, right? So we go to time sam sample time, and then like, we have sequence of, uh, what to say, values or uh, what to say, uh, sequence, time sequence of variables that we then analyze. And the, even the governing equations go into the realm of uh, uh, difference equations, right? And when we implement it in practice, we essentially uh, use digital electronics, right? So then we have a digital control system, you know, like that is my understanding of the fine nuance between the words uh, discrete and digital. So, All right, uh, so the next question, how can the response of ABS be managed? Well, it depends on the underlying system. Please note that ABS is once again built on the existing brake system. So it can be only as fast or as slow as the basic brake system. Okay, so that is the, 
that is point number one okay and it also depends on the vehicles and stocks right so to break it. Uh, so of course we can uh, design the controller to act very fast but the, if the underlying system is slow please note that you know like uh, uh, the, the the block with the slowest response is going to uh, essentially dominate the response characteristics of the overall closed loop control system right so one way to improve the response time of abs is also to have faster actuators you know because typically experience has shown that uh, the actuation is the uh, is the slowest one okay in the loop so people look at the faster modulators faster valves to do the braking process and uh, essentially the response characteristics of abs can be uh, improved okay so that is a very commonly used method Okay, what kind of control algorithm you use? Can you mention it specifically? Well, we use different levels of control. Uh, we use both uh, model-based and rule-based. Uh, in model-based, uh, uh, we use different controllers for the outer loop and the inner loop. We have also tried out sliding mode control because the uh, overall dynamics is non-linear. And for the brake controller, we have tried out uh, uh, PID control with uh, delay compensation and so on, right? Because uh, in a typical uh, vehicle brake, you know, we won't get brake force the moment we apply the brake pedal, right, isn't it? There is going to be some time difference, you know, between the instant at which we press the brake pedal and the vehicle gets braked. So delays become important, you know. So we use a PID with delay compensation uh, for the brake control loop and uh, sliding mode control for the ABS algorithm per se. That is for the model-based uh, algorithms. But in real life, when we implement, most of these algorithms are rule-based logics, you know, particularly the outer loop ones, okay? So we have been using model-based algorithms to get an understanding. And then we, we have ultimately been developing rule-based logics for indus, uh, applications with our industry partner, okay? Because please note, we are developing these tools as products for use in actual vehicles. So we are working with the industry to do this. Uh, so consequently, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, ultimately we we go somewhere in between. You know, like uh, between a model based and a rule based logic. It's a hybrid approach. You know, like if I can say so, right? So, right. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for your feedback. Yeah, I hope I have answered all the questions that have come about in the chat box till now. Oh. Uh, uh... If no more questions, so then. So, uh, sir, then uh, we will conclude, uh, sir. Uh, uh, Shankar Ram, sir, uh, it is a very uh, excellent and uh, informative uh, lecture on uh, the control systems and uh, whatever uh, you have explained. The three case studies uh, uh, will be able to. Uh, get a, a good understanding how you can able to uh, start from the parameter selection to the design of the control system for uh, uh, for your automobile applications for me. So uh, I thank you very much, sir, for your uh, uh, sparing with us with your uh, valuable time with us. And uh, uh, once again, I will thank uh, for you, sir. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Vasu, for the invitation and thanks to all the participants uh, for their attention and interaction. Yeah, thank you. Uh, best wishes to everyone and stay safe and healthy. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Good day. Bye bye. Bye. So, so participants, uh, uh, we, will have, we will meet once again at 2 o'clock, uh, 2 p.m. Uh, uh, we will have uh, today afternoon. We are having uh, two practical sessions. Uh, first, we will have uh, practical sessions on uh, uh, that uh, Tinkercad. So we will able to uh, design some small problems on uh, the Tinkercad uh, by using the Arduino board. We are having one Tinkercad software is there that uh, online available. It is a, a free source software. Uh, you can able to use that uh, and uh, we, we, our uh, student will able to explain you that step-by-step uh, -step process uh, and you try to simulate uh, hands-on practice on that one. Uh, and uh, and after that, uh, we are having uh, uh, the lab, uh, MATLAB uh, uh, also hands-on hands -on session will be there. Uh, 
there uh, you will able to have uh, uh, the modeling and simulation whatever the modeling and simulation up to now uh, you can able to model uh, this uh, abs system or whatever the systems i have told yesterday how you can able to model uh, the metatronic systems also you can able to model uh, in the lab view uh, uh, sessions uh, uh, that one uh, that is for uh, uh, in the lab view uh, not in the lab view that is matlab Okay, so now with these are two sessions, so we will meet uh, uh, at 2 p.m. exactly. So because you please uh, bear with the time, so we will start by 2 o'clock. Uh, if the people are not there also, we will start and uh, be on time. Okay, so then uh, we will call a day. We will meet you at 2, uh, 2 p.m. Okay, then bye. Uh, Jyotisha, uh, you get ready with uh, the laptop, uh, everything, okay? Ah, uh, yeah, okay.